On August 23rd, 2010, a man is found deceased in his Pimlico flat in London, England. Though originally it was determined that the death was suicide, many, many questions remain considering the fact that he was found locked inside a gym bag. You're listening to the Mysterious Bruise Podcast, and tonight we bring you the case of Gareth Williams. Welcome to a deep, dark, dank, moist basement somewhere in the bowels of Georgia where there's no fucking gas because people are assholes. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I, I had, s- for some reason where I work, the, the, the little small town where I work, everybody's being normal and they're just like getting gas when they need it and they... They're being uh, reasonable, but that's where I work. The town where I live is out of their fucking minds. Uh, the town that I live in. There's not a off. single solitary fucking place with gas right now. And it's like all those little fucking pictures you see of people filling up fucking plastic bags and fucking uh, totes and all that shit. That's happening right where I live. They're crazy. I don't understand it, but... They need to be slapped. Yeah, it's like, you played yourself, man. Like, you were doing this to yourself. They told you not to do this. Yeah, exactly. Well, with that PSA out of the way, we have another (laughs) one. And we have a (laughs) new patron at the $3 tier, Mr. Tom Nally. Thank you, Mr. Nally. Nice. Well, we do have a new five-star review from uh, Take the Cookies said five stars new binge just a couple good old boys discussing true crime i love it good old boys is definitely a good description of us because we ain't up to go no good though (laughs) but we ain't doing no harm that's right (laughs) beats all you ever saw been in trouble with the law since the day they was born i don't know since the day but there's been a couple of incidents (laughs) Making their way. The only way they know how. <laughs> well, Wait, Waylon just rolled over in his grave. <laughs> well, we posted on uh, our, our Facebook and our Instagram that, you know, we're tired of waiting for sponsors. So if, we, if you wanted to give us a shout out and tell us your small business, that we would gladly pimp it on our podcast, you know. First one is from... A-Team Plumbing and Construction. Mr. Thomas Samuels and a friend of his has started a general contracting company that specializes in plumbing. They are based out of good old Huntsville, Arkansas. But they travel all over the northwest Arkansas area. They are licensed and insured, and they are just starting their first official job on an underground plumbing for a house in, I'm going to butcher this, (laughs) Salome Springs. If you would like to get in touch with the A-Team, reach out to Mr. Samuels at 479-409-6466. Thank you, Mr. Samuels. And we also have another one from an Anthony Luke. If you listen to the uh, Crypto Podcast, which is supposed to make a grand return, I really enjoy the Crypto Podcast, but it took a hiatus for a while, but it's supposed to be coming back. We have a shout-out for... Uh, recommendation for arcus gaming which is in uh dalton georgia on 118 west crawford street if for any reason you're in the dalton area as first of all ask yourself why (laughs) second of all go to the wink theater and look across the street yeah basically right there yeah the wink theater is very famous and it's right across the street they they specialize in games like D D and warhammer and bolt action but, you know, they deserve your business. So if you're in that area, please visit them out. Tell them you heard it from us originally from the Mysterious Bruise podcast. And if you don't subscribe to Crypta, please give them a shout out and a like. Anyway, let's get to the most important thing we're doing. 
<laughs> the greatest sound on the planet. And tonight we're drinking Boddington's Pub, Pub Ale from the great nation of England because that's where our case comes from tonight. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a great segue into <laughs> Mr. Gareth Williams. He was Welsh. He was 32. He was a keen cyclist and an art lover. He was born in Anglesley, Wales, and was a gifted mathematician at a very early age. Welsh was his native language, and he began studying mathematician part-time at Bangor University while still at Wasgall, Unchard, Bodern. There's absolutely no way you did not pronounce that correctly. I know, that's spot on. That is a it has to secondary be. school in the great nation of England. Gareth would go on to graduate with a first class degree at the age of 17. He would then gain his PhD at the University of Manchester, but would drop out of another PhD course at St. Catherine's College in Cambridge. And he took up employment with the GCHQ in Cheltenham in 2001. He rented a room for nearly a decade in Pressbury, Gloucester. He had a mild stutter, which got worse when he was nervous. Back to his education, he basically, the GCHQ noticed Mr. Williams and offered him a job, which then turned into MI6, recruiting him because of his elite code-breaking skill, skills. And, and if you're not aware of the MI6, it is the, essentially the, the, the counterpart to the American CIA. And the GCHQ is currently similar to the NSA in the U.S. Now, it is the GCHQ is the government's communication headquarters. It's an intelligence and security organization responsible for providing sni- signi- z- signals <laughs> intelligence <laughs> and information to the British government and armed forces. It is based in the, quote, the donut in the suburb, suburbs of Cheltenham in the west of England. GCHQ was originally established after the First World War as the government code and cipher schools and was known under the, that name until 1946. During the Second World War, it was located at the famous Bletchley Park. Where, what did they do at Bletchley? They broke the Enigma codes. There are two main components of the GCHQ, the Composite Signals Organization, or the CSO, which is responsible for gathering information in National Cyber Security Center, which is responsible for securing the UK's own communications. Now, the Secret Intelligence Service, commonly known to us across the pond as MI6, is the Foreign Intelligence Service of the United Kingdom, tasked mainly with the covert overseas collection and analysis of human intelligence in support of the UK's national security. MI6, Military Intelligence, Section 6, was all formed in 1909 as a section of the Secret Service Bureau specializing in foreign intelligence and officially adopted its current name around 1920. SIS is involved in counterterrorism, counterproliferation, providing intelligence in support of cybersecurity, and supporting stability overseas to disrupt terrorism and other criminal activities. <laughs> that said, <laughs> this man was very bright, and you just don't have these types of agencies coming to you. No. You usually apply and hope you get in. Well, if you're that advanced, I mean, I, there are recruiters, you know, there's headhunters and stuff for the, the for the MI6, and they're going to take note of people that are highly intelligent, and they're going to want to recruit them into, into the secret world of espionage. To be a secret squirrel? <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that's what happened to him. Yes, anyone getting a degree in mathematics at the ripe old age, a college degree at the ripe old age of 17... Will be you're gonna raise some flags, yep. man. People are gonna take notice of you. Yes, and it's it's not a surprise that he ended up where he ended up. I hear you, buddy. Is that right? Okay. Is that right, Todd? Todd said that he agreed. Todd does definitely agrees. Gareth had started with the SIS in London in spring of 2009, and after taking several training courses, he started on a quote active operational work. 
Williams had recently qualified for operational deployment and had worked with the U.S. NSA and FBI agents. There are few details that were made public about his work except that he, quote, designed practical applications for emerging technologies and was deemed low risk. Although he had passed the course to become fully deployable, six months before he was found in his flat, he was only operational in the UK and not overseas. An SIS employee said an internal review had confirmed, quote, there was no evidence of any specific threat to Gareth, and we concluded there was no reason to think his death was anything to do with his work, end quote. Gareth's most recent assignment had been a, quote, hackers conference in Las Vegas, Nevada, known to have been attended by several criminal hackers from which he returned to the UK on August 11th, 2010. Now, does that say what it is? Is it DEFCON? I, it doesn't say. I got it. My business partner goes to DEFCON in Las Vegas every year because he's in cybersecurity. And that is where it's rumored that the internet infamous Cicada 3301 started. Wouldn't surprise me. And no, I've I've been telling him, you know, hey, when you go out there, find somebody that's qualified and get that motherfucker to hack into the student loans and cancel that shit. Yes, quickly, please. If you can cancel student loans, hit man, us up. I'll buy a new home. I'm in the. Uh, one, I'll, I'll buy a sec. I will stimulate the hell out of this economy. <laughs> I'm in the current 120 month plan for oh, public dude. educators. Oh my god, it's crazy. It is, but anyway. Back to the story. Anywho, a few months before, <laughs> a few months before he was discovered, he asked to return to GCHQ because he quote disliked the rat race, flash car competitions, and post work drinking cultures at MI six. Who the hell would dislike the post work drinking culture? I don't know. And since I'm he, all, was, I'm all about the post work drinking culture. Since he was a cyclist. And a avid hiker, he wanted to get back to life in the countryside. Now, as I recently stated, he had rented the same flat apartment for roughly 10 years. The letting agent of the flat in central London that he rented said it had been leased by the UK government Secretary of State since 2003. However, MI6 said... It had not arranged the let, and GCHQ said it was a private rental through an appro- approved letting agency. Approved? We proved and we proved. <laughs> now, we often talk about a mother's intuition, but today we will talk about a sister's intuition. Oh, interesting. Gareth's sister, Sari, knew that Gareth was a loner, But she became worried when she could not get a hold of him in mid-August of 2010. She contacted his employer, which at the time was MI6, and discussed her worries with Mr. Williams' superior. At the inquest, it was noted that not enough had been done to check on the welfare of one of their agents. But a person whose identity was protected by a court order named Witness G., said he made some calls and visited Gareth's flat. The Williams family lawyer countered that the call records showed no attempt to phone Gareth's mobile and no one else living in the block saw anyone make a welfare visit. So on Monday, the 23rd of August, Witness G called Sari to say that he had been unable to locate her brother. She, in turn, called the Metropolitan Police, and they broke into his flat at approximately 4.30 p.m. that same day. Everybody's fears were realized when Gareth was found dead in a very suspicious manner. Yeah, and this is the first case where I would state that the official ruling is utter. I would look at it and go, you're out of your fucking mind. Yep. So, they're, I mean, I hate this, I hate to jump ahead, but they're gonna, originally, 
determine that if this was a suicide. But he's going to be found in a very precarious way. Would you like to uh, elaborate? Let, elaborate on that. Would you like to let them know how he was found? Yeah, we'll go ahead and let this little nugget out, and then we'll circle back. He was found in a North Face duffel bag, not very big, completely naked, dead, in his bathtub with a padlock through both zippers. Yeah, he's going to be locked inside this bag. Come on. <laughs> it's just it's just insane. Clearly, the bag is going to be locked from the outside, and they're going to determine that he locked himself in and committed suicide. What? Yeah, those just don't go together. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so, man. I don't either. Getting into Gareth's flat, police visited his home, like I said, and broke in roughly around 4.30 p.m. on August the 23rd of 2010 as the welfare check after he was... Or after he had not been seen for several days. His flat was on the top floor, number four, on 36 Alderney Street, Pimlico, London. They found a red North Face bag, padlocked from the outside, in the bathtub of the main bedroom's in-suite bathroom. PC John Gallagher, who was attending the scene, attempted to lift the bag, but became concerned when a reddish-brown liquid seeped from it, and he left it in the bath. A small incision was then made into the bag, and a naked, decomposing body was found inside. The body was in a fetal position with arms folded, and a yell lock had been used to fasten the eyelets and toggle of the bag, which is the zipper. A search of the flat revealed $20,500 U.S. dollars, or approximately 15,000 pounds, no, 15,000 euros, of designer clothes and shoes, including labels such as Stella McCartney and Christian Louboutin, all stored unopened in their bags and boxes alongside a number of women's wigs. You know how I can tell that's fancy? It's because we have neither one of us have ever heard of those brands. Nope, I had to look them up. <laughs> they're a little, they're a little pricey. One of these wigs was an orange one. And it was hung on the table, and we will post a picture of said wig on this table to our socials. Family members said designer clothes were merely a sign of his generosity as he bought expensive gifts for his family members. Also, all the clothing that was in his flat was in a size 6 or 8, which he would not even fit an arm or a leg into, and the shoes they found in his apartment were not in his size, but they were in his sister's size. As for the women's wigs... They dismissed this, stating that an American friend was going to a fancy dress party and one of the hobbies was a Japanese superhero cartoon and they were going to go as two of those characters. They were pink and yellow and those are the only wigs that were found. Which leads to the question, where the hell did the orange one come from? The police released a photo of two people they were seeking to question who had a, quote, Mediterranean look. They were seen to enter the communal entrance of his home in June or July of 2010. Police would later dismiss the two as potential suspects. There's a composite drawing of them on a website that we'll also post. But they just kind of like, no, nah, not them. They have, no, they have nothing to do with it. <laughs> it was rumored that Gareth, who was in his early 30s, was gay after bondage equipment was allegedly found in his apartment along with phone numbers for gay escorts. Well, okay, well, I was about to say, how does the bondage equipment make you gay but the, the escorts? Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> now, this was denied by police, but they did disclose in December of 2010 that Gareth had visited some bondage websites which were not pornographic but would give readers advice on how to get in and out of confined spaces. In the latter official inquest... They said these visits were infrequent and isolated and were only a small part of his online activity. Police also said they found tickets for a number of drag shows. Then there were reported irregularities in his finances, which were also denied. Members of his family included his 
including his confidant and childhood sweetheart, Sian Lloyd-Jones, said he had been given a new identity by MI6 and rejected the various claims against Garth. Our Garth. Garth? Like uh, yeah. Wayne and Garth? Yeah. Now, the family also denied he was homosexual, as none of the family had heard any mention of this. He had too much interest in women, according to Sane, and he wanted a girlfriend, a wife, and a family. They certainly denied he had any interest in confined spaces or women's clothes fetishes. The Metropolitan Police investigation was run by Detective Chief Inspector Jackie Sebrer, the senior investigating officer, and her boss, Detective Chief Superintendent Hamish Campbell, who was in charge of the Homicide and Serious Crime Command. Let's just take a moment and say that it's the first time I've seen Hamish outside of... The, the movies. The movie Braveheart. <laughs> <laughs> now, Williams' date of death was estimated to have been in the early hours of August 16th of 2010, one week before he was found. Vincent Williams from the London Metropolitan Police informed the Westminster Coroner's Court that experts were agreed that it was impossible for Gareth to have locked himself into the North Face bag. Soon after the investigation started, the heads of the SIS and the Metropolitan Police met to discuss how the police would handle the investigation in light of the top-secret nature of Williams' work and who would lead the investigation. The U.S. State Department asked that no details of Williams' work should emerge at the inquest. Foreign Secretary in the U.K. government, William Hague, signed a public interest immunity certificate authorizing the withholding from the inquest of details of Williams' work and U.S. joint operations. That just doesn't happen if you're just a regular code breaker. No, absolutely not. That is a very, a exceptionally large red flag. I mean, come on. Just hoist it up right in the center of (laughs) London and say, looky here. Yeah, I mean, he must have been involved in something very important for something like that to happen. Now we get to the coroner's inquest. Probably the Paul McCartney's death, you know, they're covering up that. Exactly. Know, they've been covering that up for 40 years, you know. <laughs> I thought it was more like 60, but <laughs> anyway. 50, 60, 40, 50. 40, 50, 60. Who, yeah, knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> At the official inquest into the death in March of 2012, coroner Fiona Wilcox said that there were no obvious visible injuries on Gareth's body and no signs that he had been involved in a struggle. His body was also free of alcohol and common recreational drugs. The Metropolitan Police, or as they are referred across the pond, the Met, considered his death, quote, suspicious and unexplained, end quote, at the time, but later changed their mind. The FBI also conducted their own investigation into the case. A police spokesperson (laughs) stated that, quote, if he was alive, he got into it voluntarily, or if not, he was unconscious and placed in the bag, end quote. Family said they believed that a Secret Service agency was involved in his death. Fiona Wilcox, the coroner, said that she would, quote, follow the evidence, end quote, wherever it may lead. Evidence at the inquest showed that it would have been virtually impossible for Williams to have locked himself in the bag. Virtually my ass, it is impossible. Yeah, very much so. Like You can't zip we'll, the we'll, damn... Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get we'll into get it. Into it but. So, <laughs> two experts at the inquest were unable to lock themselves in a similar bag despite making 400 attempts to do so. Although one stated there was a small chance Williams had managed the feat. No, no chance in hell. However, because you've got no chance, (laughs) no chance in hell. Subsequent videos on the use of tubes have appeared that suggest (laughs) that the feat is possible, but given Gareth's height and weight, it would indeed be very, very difficult, but not impossible. I still say horseshit. It yeah, is impossible. It's, it, I mean, it's it's not gonna happen. You know, no, gonna it's it. not gonna happen. It's okay. We'll get into it in our theories, but good God Almighty, 
It is not fucking possible. Renowned pathologist Richard Shepard said it was more likely that Williams was alive when he got into the bag due to the difficulty of arranging a corpse in the position Williams' body was found in. Another pathologist, Ian Calder, stated that Williams would have been overcome by hypercapnia, elevated carbon dioxide levels, after only two or three minutes in the bag. It was also noted at the inquest held in March of 2012 that he never visited any website devoted to claustrophobia, a, a sexual interest in being confined in small spaces. Another odd thing is the heating in Gareth's apartment was found to be turned on to a high level. It has been suggested an elevated temperature inside the apartment would have sped up the decomp of his body. The lawyer for the family, Anthony O'Toole, at the inquest said that a second person was either A, present when Williams died, or B, someone broke in afterward and stole items. There was no forensic evidence to support this view. No sign of forced entry could be found, but it was also noted that the door and locks had been removed by the time police experts had become involved. Gareth's family alleged that crucial DNA was interfered with, I guess that's what they call it, and that fingerprints left at the sign the sign at the scene were wiped off as part of a cover up inconclusive fragments of dna components from at least two other contributors were found on the bag no fingerprints palm prints footprints or traces of williams own dna were found on the rim of the bag the bag zipper or the bag bag padlock or the tub itself a key to the padlock was inside the bag underneath his right buttock. DNA found on Williams' hand turned out to be contamination from one of the forensic scientists. LGC, the forensic company, apologized that their error had inflicted such pain on the family caused by the incorrect data entry of a numerical code. Evidence given by Williams' former landlady and Cheltenham showed that one night he had awoken her and her husband screaming for help. Apparently, he had managed to tie himself to his bed and required assistance in releasing himself. The testimony that was that Williams had claimed at the time that he had done it just to see if he could free himself and that he promised not to try this again. <laughs> Nothing further had been said about this incident after the event. Journalist Duncan Campbell reported that the inquest evidence indicated Williams was one of a team of intelligence officers sent to penetrate U.S. and U.K. hacking networks. He had attended the 22, or I'm sorry, he had attended the 2010 Black Hat briefings and DEF CON conferences. There you go. Two senior British police sources have said one of Williams' work was focused on Russia and one confirmed report that he had been helping the NSA trace international money laundering routes that are used by organized crime groups, including Moscow-based mafia cells. Now, the coroner's conclusion, and that is Miss Fiona Wilcox, stated that William's death was, quote, unnatural and likely to have been criminally meditated, end quote. The coroner was satisfied that on the balance of probabilities that Gareth was killed unlawfully, she is also on record stating that, quote, the most of the fundamental questions in relation to how Gareth died remain unanswered, end quote. There was insufficient evidence to give a verdict of unlawful killing. Now, let's, I don't know if I get into this later, but the coroner's inquest in England cannot be swayed. It is almost a court case where once an inquest is requested then they do their own thing and whatever they come up with whatever conclusions they come up it's, with it's like official it's like, official official yeah, okay. they cannot be bribed that well i'm sure they can but according to most <laughs> once, things that once I saw, they once they turn in the report that's what happened yeah i get what you're saying yeah so you didn't say it very well. I didn't, but, but I, got I, I, got I, I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> the coroner concluded that another party placed the bag containing Gareth into the bath, and 
on the balance of probabilities locked the bag. No fingerprints were found around the bath. The coroner was critical of SIS for failing to report Williams missing for seven days, which caused extra anguish and suffering for his family and led to the loss of forensic evidence. The coroner rejected suicide, interest in bondage or cross-dressing, or autoerotic activity being involved in Williams' death. She said his visits to bondage websites only occurred intermittently and were not of a frequency to indicate an active interest. The coroner condemned leaks about cross-dressing as a possible attempt at media manipulation. The coroner was also highly critical of the Met and their counterterrorism command, SO-15, who failed to tell the senior investigating officer before the inquest began of the existence of nine memory sticks and other property in Williams's SIS office. SO-15 failed to take formal statements when interviewing SIS officers. The coroner said the possible involvement of other SIS staff in the death was a legitimate line of inquiry for the police. Finding by the coroner prompted a reinvestigation by the Metropolitan Police, which lasting a further 12 months, which officers said had been allowed unprecedented access to serving MI6 staff following strong criticism at the inquest. Subsequent to the coroner's hearing, the Metropolitan Police reinvestigation concluded that Williams's death was quote, probably an accident, and that an evidence review had found it was more probable no other person was present when he died in his London flat. The Metropolitan Police Deputy Assistant Commissioner Martin Hewitt announced that despite a re-examination of all evidence and the investigation of new leads, no definitive answers had been obtained as to the cause of Williams's death and the, quote, most probable scenario was that he had died alone in his flat in Pimlico, central London, as the result of accidentally locking himself inside the bag. Horse shit! (laughs) The Williams family responded to say they stood by the coroner's original findings, and in a statement, they said, quote, We are naturally disappointed that it is still not possible to state with certainty how Gareth died and the fact that that the circumstances of his death are still unknown adds to our grief. We consider that on the basis of the facts at present known, the coroner's verdict accurately reflects the circumstances of Gareth's death, end quote. Martin Hewitt said he was satisfied with the, quote, theoretically possible, end quote, scenario in which Williams could have padlocked the bag from the inside, although... Many questions remain unanswered as to the circumstances of his death. But he said there was no evidence that the MI6 officer had intended to take his own life or that his death was connected to his work. And he went on and insisted it was, quote, beyond credibility that he had been misled. I do not believe that I have had the wool pulled over my eyes. I believe that what we are dealing with is a tragic, unexplained death, end quote. You're a dumbass, buddy. (laughs) You were led around by the nose. The police said there were about 10 to 15 traces of DNA in the flat from which it had not been possible to gain full profiles, but all other DNA profiles and fingerprints had been eliminated. Hewitt also said there was no evidence that the flat had been forensically cleaned, adding it was a, quote, fallacy that it had been deep cleaned in such a way that only certain DNA was left in the premises. He acknowledged that the coroner, having studied all the evidence available at the stage, had made the logical inference that it was more likely someone else was involved in Gareth's death. However, she also recognized that there had been endless speculation, but little real evidence, and it was her view that it is unlikely his death will ever be satisfactorily explained. Now, at the end of their investigation, based on the evidence, or where they would have been unable to find positive evidence, they believe that it was more probable conclusion that there was no other person present when Gareth died. But the reality is that for both hypotheses, there exist evidential contradictions and gaps in their understanding. 
What? <laughs> They they said something, but it didn't make no damn no, sense. No, none, none of it makes sense. None of their explanations are going to make sense in this case. They're really going out of their way to try to prove that there was no one else there. Yeah. And, I mean... This stinks. Yeah. Uh, come on. Come on. Yeah. You, you're not going to convince anyone. I have a feeling. Anywhere. That, that there wasn't a second party involved. Yeah. I have a feeling that he put himself in there about as much as Epstein hung himself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I agree with you. <laughs> so in September and October of 2015, Boris Karpichkov, a former KGB agent who defected from Russia and was living in Britain, stated during interviews that, quote, sources in Russia have claimed that the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service also named as the SBR, was responsible for Williams' murder. According to Karpichkov, the SBR tried and failed to blackmail Williams into becoming a double agent. In response to the SBR's attempts, Williams apparently claimed that he knew the identity of a Russian spy inside GCHQ. Karpichkov claimed that Williams' threat meant that the SBR then had no alternative but to exterminate him in order to protect their agent inside GCHQ. Regarding the cause of death, Karpichkov claimed that the SBR killed Williams, quote, by an untraceable poison introduced into his ear, end quote. Yeah, but, okay, but how did they get him in the bag in the position that he was in? I guess they poisoned his ass as soon as he fell over. They stuffed his ass in there, turned the heat up, and walked out. I mean, okay. All right. No, I agree with you. I mean, this 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 reeks of like a damn Hollywood movie. It, it is insane. Yeah. Also in 2015, a story emerged that Gareth had illegally hacked secret information on former president, <laughs> Bill Clinton, <laughs> as a personal favor to a friend. <laughs> what? Williams snagged a guest list to a party that the former president planned to attend and handed the secret information over to a friend who was also invited to the event. The breach of Williams' security clearance apparently provoked the ire of the MI6. So you're going to give away a, a guest list to a, a party and, and the that's, MI6 that's is going, going to be off enough your ass. Yeah. to off you? I don't think I don't so. buy that. I don't, I don't buy that for a second. Deputy, I know, no, I know, sorry. I know you want to tie everything to Clinton. I know you do. I really don't. That was just <laughs> in there, and I thought this is this makes about as much sense as everything else they've tried to explain. <laughs> I know, I know you, man. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I did not have se- well. It's, you have to. We have to look at the definition of party list. <laughs> <laughs> So, Detective Chief Superintendent Hamish Campbell was interviewed about Gareth's case in not, February of 2021. Not Hamish. I know. The former Metropolitan Police Detective Chief, who retired and was now working as the Assistant Commissioner for the Independent Commission of Investigations in Jamaica, spoke to the Times what? newspaper. Yeah. He retired... And he just decided, you know what, I'll just up and move to Jamaica and work as an assistant commissioner for the Independent Commission of Investigation. Buffalo soldier. Dun, 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 dun. Dreadlock Rasta. <laughs> so Hamish speaks to the Times, and he was in charge of many notorious cases in London, including the murder of TV personality Jill Dando in Fulham in 1999 and Operation U-Tree, which investigated the aftermath of the Jimmy Seville pedophile allegations. Oh, Jesus Christ. Jimmy Seville is a fucking piece oh, of shit. shit. And bragged about it for years. I don't care. I hate that son of a bitch. Well, <laughs> if any of you are listening are on the side of Jimmy Seville, fuck off. Please stop listening. Yes. We don't say that much, but if you... Because, good God. Okay, so anyway. Now, in his interview, Hamish said that a semen stain on the bathroom floor suggested that Gareth had been engaged in sexual activity shortly before his death. 
Hamish also believed that he, this made the idea of an assassination by a foreign state highly unlikely. Quote, I felt like it was improbable his bodily fluid could be present in a violent, non-consenting scenario, end quote. He went on to say, quote, considering Gareth's tidiness and cleanliness, we surmise the semen was from the day of his entry into the bag. This would have been consensual activity, but was he alone or not? It would be difficult to imagine him having intimacy with a Russian hitman or a female spy. It would be difficult? Are you rhetor are rhetorical? <laughs> <laughs> rhetorical. Thank, thanks, thanks for. Uh, I called it abstaining from that word. He, what? The, no, Hamish, you are really screwing up your great name. Hamish is a cool name. It is a really cool name. But I'll give you that. Okay, so he goes on to state in this interview that there was no signs of struggle, no forced entry, and no bruises on his on Gareth's body. Inside the bag near the head were some tiny scratches. I think that was unlikely to have been done with his fingernails, Hamish said. I also believe those marks were made by the keys inside the bag. The inquiry team found fragments of DNA belonging to two unidentified people on the padlock and the handle of the bag. Those people were never identified, which, duh, he just said they were unidentified. And a green towel in the flat carried an unknown person's DNA. That person also was never traced. Based on the evidence in the flat, Hamish believes Williams entered the bag on his own free will. Quote, It is a bizarre thing to do voluntarily, but I don't stand by the idea of forcing him into the bag. He said if he was forced to do it, there was not a single mark on his body to suggest any violence or forced activity. So how do you remove his clothes and force him into a bag? Then force him to squeeze it until it is zipped up. Do you do it at gunpoint? Well, if that's the case, then why not just shoot him? What the evidence leaves you with is that Gareth consented to get inside the bag either on his own or with other parties not yet identified. One obvious question was whether Gareth was linked or his death was linked to his work. And Hamish states, quote, We looked at some aspects of his work to try to discover if it had anything to do with him being killed. Was his work dangerous? Did he argue with anybody in in his job? Was he having a relationship with somebody at work who was jealous? We didn't find anything, end quote. On the subject of the designer clothes found at the flat, Hamish states, quote, We never found any evidence that he had a girlfriend or any sort of partner. He lived alone. There were no signs that he was in a relationship, end quote. Which we know that's not true because... At the inquest, they interview his girlfriend, and his sister is the one that asked for them to do the welfare check. This guy bumped his head while smoking his crap pipe. <laughs> Good Lord, the more I read this, the matter I get it. Stupid people. <laughs> and that's stupid, as in S-T-E-W-P-I-D. Yeah, they did not uh, They did not do Gareth justice. Gareth justice. Hamish also believed the box items were linked to his fashion design courses, but the motive was never established with any degree of certainty. Where in the hell did they find that he was taking fashion design courses? <laughs> We're just making shit up now. All right, so Hamish's own record is stating, quote, The belief that they were bought for him to give as gifts never held much credence. Why not give them? He wasn't a hoarder of belongings, nor was there evidence or suggestion he was storing them on another's behalf. The reason view is that they were his items. He bought them. He retained them. He wore or was to wear them, end quote, which we know is not true because the sizes are too small. Hamish believes the absence of fingerprints on the bath or bathroom tiles proves nothing. Quote, why would you expect to find fingerprints, he said. Where is your knowledge base for that? Everyone has been in the shower. How often do you touch the wall of the bathroom? And if there is running water... Would there be fingerprints on the wall? He also goes on to rule out the idea of a Russian assassination, saying the death was different from the hits on the Russian defectors, Alexander Litvinenko in London in 2006, and Sergei Skripal 
in Salisbury in 2018. In those cases, the motive was clear revenge for the betrayal of the Kremlin and a warning to others. Hamish has stated, quote, what would have been achieved by killing a junior analyst? He was a phone analyst, an expert in terms of mobile phones and the transference of data. What would the Russians or any other state have achieved by killing him? End quote. Hamish believes the answer to his death lies in his private life. He mentions the landlady who found him tied naked to the bed and evidence of visits to bondage and other fetish websites, as well as images of drag queens. Some searches related to models in various forms of, quote, hog tie bondage position. Hamish said a video on one of Williams' phone found in his office showed him dancing naked except for black leather boots. <laughs> hey, uh, I don't hey, judge. I don't know. We're not here to judge, man. You be, can't, be, I'm not going to kink shame unless you... Yeah, you be you. Yeah. You be you, man. The only kink shame here is all pedophiles should be shot. Oh, well, that's not really kink shame. That's, True. That's more facts. Yeah. <laughs> Hamish says, quote, I think he shot the video himself. The phone found in his flat had been restored to factory settings in the hours before he died. Detectives found that he went to fetish clubs visit visiting a Johnny Woo drag act in East London a few days before he died. He in, dried? Yeah, he dried. He was well, soaking wet. <laughs> yeah, he was very wet. <laughs> in Hamish's view, this was a hidden part of Williams's character that may explain why he got into the bag. Quote, this all formed part of who he was, end quote. He said that if others had been involved, they might have left in a hurry. Quote, it wouldn't be the first time in homicide and sex games that the death has caused a panic. Then there's a cover-up to avoid responsibility or to avoid shame or embarrassment. Hamish believes that forensic advances could allow scientists to delve deeper into the partial DNA fa fragments found on the bag. The police national database may offer new clues as thousands of forensic profiles are added each year. And he states, quote, you can never say never in relation to forensic reviews, end quote. Swabs taken of the DNA on the padlock and zipper still exist. Existed, he said, while the towel found with an unidentified person's DNA could not also be worth retesting. Quote, forensics do move on. I have experience of reviews where forensics alone will bring a case forward. Not a lot else will, to be honest. It may be that an independent forensic company could be asked to have another look at it within a proper framework. That would be a sensible and reasonable thing to do. Gareth Williams was buried at Yen's Wynn Cemetery in Valley Anglesey on September 26 of 2010 following a private funeral service at Bethel Chapel in Hollyhead, attended by his family, friends, former colleagues in the intelligence service, and also by the head of MI6, Sir John Sowers. Now there's some theories out there. Before we get into ours, there's some theories that we would like to touch on. One is called misadventure. Getting into a North Face bag has been shown to be possible, but very difficult. But fastening said bag with a padlock without a third-party assistance would seem to be impossible. It is impossible. You can't lock. You can't put a tiny lock in between the two zipper holes. Zip it shut and Z clasp it. Zip it completely shut and clasp it. It's impossible. It's impossible. The bag being left in the bathtub and the heating being raised or left on high both support a situation where decomposition was expected and accounted for. Any bodily fluids leaking from the bag would have run down the drain. If Gareth had been attempting some sort of game in the bag for whatever reason, why do it in the bath? It's a good point. Well, I mean, if you're, I mean, why not? I, I, I mean, that, that right there, if it's some sort of kinky fucking game, who, I mean, why not in the bath? There's no reason for it to not be, but I guess I, they're, I don't agree with the fact that it's a, a, it's a kinky game or whatever. I guess their theory is if you're kink, if you're doing kink, then why not do it somewhere other than your bathtub? Well, I mean, I get that, but I'm just saying if that was the case, which I don't believe, what difference does it make if it's the bath, it's the bedroom, it's the hallway? Well, who cares? True. I agree. I see where but, you're coming from. 
I think it's in the bath because it was a li- it was a deliberate thing. And they oh, were, I agree too. Yeah, they were trying to make sure that if it punctured, yeah, exactly, yeah, conceal some evidence. Yeah, exactly. The other theory is suicide, which I say Mm-mm. no. Uh-uh. It seems unlikely as there were no signs of mental health issues, and Gareth had been due to meet his sister two days after his death, and had already booked a hiking holiday in Switzerland. The other one is foul play, criminal activity, or secret squirrel activity. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. I'm, I'm leaning strongly this way. Even though there were no signs of a struggle and no injuries to the body. There were no signs of a break-in at the flat. But if the lock on the front door was off like someone had claimed, then they can just walk in. There's no, there was no data on Gareth's laptops or phones that revealed anything suspicious, but an iPhone at his flat had been reset to factory settings just before his death. It was impossible to tell if it was done manually or remotely. Police said that the service provider had no data history, which they took to mean no calls or website browsing had taken place. The degree of decomp made it impossible to rule out poisoning as the heat had been turned up in the flat, despite it being the height of summer in August. A very puzzling nugget. Mm. There was little or no DNA in the flat, which again is strange. The police deny that the flat was forensically cleaned by persons unknown. Even Gareth's fingerprints were nowhere to be found. He inexplicably would need to wipe any finger or palm prints from every surface in the bathroom before getting in the bag. Even if he was trying to get into the bag by himself, he would have needed to touch the side or the bottom of the bath or the tiles at some point during his attempt, but nothing was found. Gareth would somehow have to have locked the bag on the outside from the inside and then wiped all of of his fingerprints off the lock afterwards. His belongings at MI6 were in a shared cabinet with a combination lock used by others and only examined three days after his death. Plenty of time to get rid of some shit. His GCHQ equipment was examined shortly after. Detective Constable Simon Warren, who examined his laptops, memory sticks, CDs, and DVDs, said, quote, any data even at the lowest levels can be changed or deleted, end quote. But he said there was no evidence files had been amended since his death. Well, if they're working secret squirrel activity, they know how to not leave evidence. So why did it take MI6 so long to report him missing? He had been missing meetings on August 16th and 20th of 2010, but no one raised the alarm after he was missing for more than seven days. Gareth's failure to turn up for work was considered unusual, but his manager failed to take action after his sister had been in touch. For some reason, his manager failed to raise an alarm, which certainly impacted the forensic evidence, especially in a heated flat. Forensics officers were also of the opinion that the crime scene had been tampered with. A source told the Daily Mirror that forensic tiles to preserve the scene had been moved on the first evening. They believed someone had broken into the flat through the skylight to bypass the police guard. Mission Impossible. I mean, they're just coming down. So there is an experiment. Actually, not just a experiment. There is a ton of experiments on YouTube where people try to recreate this by getting into a bag. And not one person of the multitude of attempts are able to replicate this this activity. Now, one of the more well-thought-out ones and well-documented one is by David Winpenny. And he is of similar size and similar build to Gareth. He purchased what he said was an identical North Face bag, but at the very least, it's extremely similar, (laughs) and placed it in his own bathtub. His buddy filmed him making the attempt to replicate the way Gareth was found, minus the naked aspect. Interestingly, he was able to fit inside the bag without a great deal of fuss. However, the design of the bag made it impossible for someone inside to attach a padlock to the outside zippers. 
another interesting twist was that Mr. Winpenny was able to chat comfortably in the zipped bag for over six minutes. This throws out the opinion that Gareth asphyxiated in two to three minutes. Now we get to the tampered evidence. Dun, dun, dun. There are other worrying aspects to the case. (laughs) (laughs) And we are going to touch on the fact that Gareth's mobile phone was found to be reset to factory defaults on the 15th of August, the day before he was supposedly died. Yeah, but he could have done that himself. I mean, it's suspicious. I agree 100%. But, I mean... Well, and there, the the article I found stated that anybody worth their salt, if you were a rogue agent or a foreign spy, would know to wipe a phone because any of their calls would be able to be yeah, traced. exactly. Now, does this point to him having information that could not be traced by network? I don't know. Who knows? I photos. Mean, we'll never, we, we can't know. No. There were no photos, encrypted messaging. The list could be quite long, excludes normal phone calls or location data. What's most confusing is why he didn't use a burner phone for an anonymous activity. Now, they state that Gareth would know the likelihood of MI6 being able to find out information on his phone. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're tracking that shit. Mm, For sure. If the Coca-Cola company can tell me when I worked for them that I wasn't at Walmart when I said I was, I'm pretty sure the MI6 can know what's going on. (laughs) Yeah, no doubt. They say it's more likely that Gareth would have had another mobile if he was doing anything wrong. The only reason his phone was reset was because someone else needed to destroy something on there that Gareth did not see the danger in. Could be something as simple as a contact entry, a new friend, or seemingly innocent photo. Eh, that makes sense. Well, when you're covering your tracks, you got to cover your tracks completely. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter what's on that phone. If you wipe the entire flat down, you're going to reset the phone. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Forensics officers were also of the opinion that the crime scene had been tampered with. A source told the Daily Mirror that, like I stated earlier, the forensic tiles, which is used by CSI to tread on whilst preserving the scene, had been moved on the first evening. They believed someone had broke in through the skylight to bypass the police guard. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, Self, this is just a one-off. How can this really be that big of a deal? I mean, it is a little questionable, but... Is it really something that needs to be covered? Well, gather around, children, because this is not just a one-off. The Daily Mail did an article from 2012 that wrote, and they state, quote, an analysis of the 17 suspicious deaths involving suspected British agents over the past 50 years shows almost a third have involved damning allegations about about their sexual proclivities, adding to the air of confusion and mystery around their unexplained deaths. There are only two options here. Either work in the intelligence community attracts people with unusual sexual tastes, or these are concocted after death to cloud the waters. Given the nature of the industry, one of those options is far more likely than the other. And given the similarity of these historic cases, it increases the odds that Gareth's death was murder and not suicide. And the article states that the first one was Jonathan Moyle in March of 1990. Mr. Moyle had links to the arms trade with Iraq. He was investigating the sale of armed helicopters as a journalist, but was also working for MI6. The investigation took him to Chile, where he attracted the wrong sort of attention. He called his mother from his hotel room to say someone had broken in and ransacked it. Hours later, he would be found dead, hanging naked inside a wardrobe with a pillowcase over his head. His family fought for years to have his reputation restored. A syringe was found at the scene, and the removal of his organs made a full autopsy impossible. In 1998, the British government admitted that Mr. Moyle had been killed unlawfully and apologized for sexual smears. Stephen Milligan, on the 7th of February, 1994, the conservative 
Metropolitan Police Officer was believed to have had strong links to the intelligence services, not least because he became Secretary of the Foreign and Commonwealth Council in 1991. He was also Secretary to the Defense Minister. Both these roles would have put him in contact with MI6. It was rumored that he was on the verge of whistleblowing illegal arms sales to Iraq when he was found dead at his home in London. He was naked except for a pair of women's stockings and suspenders. A bin bag was over his head, tied in place with an electrical cord around his neck. A slice of orange had been wedged into his mouth. The, quote, arms to Iraq scandal in the U.K. in the 90s had echoes of the Iran-Contra affairs in the 1980s in the U.S. with similar fatal results. A verdict of death by misadventure was recorded in Milligan's death. It may have rested as such if another suspicious murder had not occurred 10 days later. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. On February 16th of 1994, James Russ Bridger, the former MI6 agent, had turned into a vocal critic of the security services in the 1980s. It is conceivable that a man such as Stephen Milligan would have been turned to Russ Bridger for advice or help. The proximity of their very similar deaths is not to be dismissed lightly. It was found that he had written to a TV station shortly after Milligan's death, stating that he would begin to investigate it. If there was no other link, this may have been enough to get the wrong people on his case. Russ Bridger was found hanging in his loft wearing a green hazmat suit, a plastic Macintosh, and rubber gloves. On his head was a gas mask, and he apparently spread BDSM and pornographic Im images around the floor of his loft. The verdict was death by asphyxia. At 65 years of age at the time of his death, one has to question whether someone that old would still be partaking in such activities voluntarily. The next on the list is Nicholas Husband, December of 1996. However... There's not much out there about him. He was found dead wearing women's clothing with a plastic bag over his head. And the last one is Kevin Allen in March of 1999. He was 31 years old and like Nicholas' husband, he was also an employee at the GCHQ. He was found dead at his parents' home, a plastic bag over his head and a dusk mask over his mouth. The verdict was again asphyxia. So the question we now have to ask ourselves is, if this kind of sexual game is common amongst men and appears to be so dangerous, why aren't we hearing of many more cases where the victim wasn't a member of the Secret Services? Maybe because it doesn't fucking happen, or at least it doesn't happen accidentally. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the case of Gareth Williams. Now we get into our theories, which I'm, you know, we've stated all night long. I honestly believe he was killed because you're not getting yourself into the bag and locking it, then wiping the fingerprints off. Yeah, it is 1,000% impossible for him to do that. So there was 100% a third party involved. Now, whether or not that was a Russian spy or it was just a prostitute he hired to do some kinky shit and she locked him in and... And then freaked the fuck out and wiped everything down and raised his phone. Yeah, exactly. That, that, I mean, it's possible. But, yeah, there's something very nefarious going on. There is no way that he locked himself in that bag. He was murdered. Whether accidentally or purposely, I can't say. But one of the ones that in 94, Milligan or James Rush Bridger had ties to the Castellaro octopus thing. Oh, Jesus. Whew, yeah. Man. I didn't even chase that rabbit. I was like, nope. Mm -mm, I ain't going there. We got what? Ch um, something Morgan. Chuck Morgan. What, is, that, is that his name? I think so. Yeah. Uh, Chuck Morgan and then Danny Castellaro. Uh, just, whew, the octopus thing is just crazy. That would be like 10 parts. Yeah, I, would, I would think we could do it in three long ones, but we haven't touched it yet. But man, it, it is wild if you haven't heard about it. Just Google the octopus under your own um, discretion <laughs> and look into that shit. That is crazy. But yeah, but as far as uh, Gareth goes, he was murdered. Yeah, hands down. Bottom, I mean, there's no, there's absolutely no way. 
I mean, think about it. Think about a gym bag and you zip it up to where the zippers meet and you have a tiny lock and you have to thread it through and lock the lock. You can't do that inside the bag. Much less make sure there's no fingerprints on said zippers and lock. Yeah, you just can't. This man was murdered. For why? For what purpose? I don't know. Whether it was the Russians, whether it was an MI6, an inside job type thing, I, I can't tell you. But I can tell you with a thousand percent certainty that he didn't do this to himself. Bottom line. Agreed 1,000%. <laughs> <laughs> now, this stinks of cover-up, just outright lies. Well, and the fact that his, his door was locked from the outside, the heat was turned all the way up, he was in the bag, locked from the, in, from the outside. I mean, you there's nothing you can tell me that will convince me that he did this to himself. No, nothing. Nothing. There's nothing out there. I totally agree. Well, recommendation. I'm going to recommend that you don't use Facebook because I am currently on a 30 day ban for something that I posted in a meme group, an offensive meme group with some jujitsu guys that I'm friends with. I posted it three weeks ago, and I got banned today for 30 days. I can't even use Messenger for 30 days because of some bullshit. So if you're on the Facebook group and you wonder why I haven't posted in a while, or if you follow Mysterious Brews, the, the web page, I can't, I can't even post on that. I can't do shit. So that's my recommendation is fuck Facebook. Zuckerberg can suck a dick. <laughs> Zuckerberg. Yeah. Alien looking motherfucker. Oh, he's not human. No. If there's if there's reptilians on this planet, he's he is definitely one of him them. Him the Queen of England. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> I agree. All right. My recommendation is not that. But it is a podcast called Legends of the Old West. And they did a four part series. They're about 30 minutes each, on Frank Hamer, the famous never, Texas Ranger who killed Bonnie and Clyde. Dude, they did Bonnie and Clyde wrong, man. Yeah. That ambush was fucking intense. Yeah. They they didn't give them a chance to surrender nothing. They're just, bah, 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 using the Brownings AR, you know, the... BARs. BARs and... Yeah. Thompson submachine guns, they just lit them up. They did, man. They did. I don't blame them, but, you know, it could have went a different way. If you are interested in Bonnie and Clyde, uh, Stephanie Harlow has done a eight-part series on Bonnie and Clyde, and she dives deep into their past, their families and stuff. It's on YouTube. You know, we shout her out anytime we can. So those are my recommendations. Well, you got anything else there, slap face? Yeah, I think we said it all, I brother. think we did, It's too. a long episode. It's a lot longer than I thought it would be. Yeah, for sure. So let's just cut it out right now. Okay, man. <laughs> Deuces! <laughs>